Well, hello and welcome back. Uh, my name is Guy Stevens. I'm the founder and executive director of the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint. I thank you for joining us for this Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint live event. Uh, those of you that may know who we are and what we do, we do these events about every two weeks. Uh, we feature a lot of amazing guests as well as you know parents, teachers, educators, uh, self-advocates, and, and really a lot of fantastic people that are that are doing amazing work to change things and improve things around supporting kids. Of course, the Alliance Against Seclusion and Restraint started with a very particular purpose. Uh, we were looking at the use of restraint and seclusion in schools, which has been problematic across the country, and, and trying to find better ways to support kids. Uh, we work to kind of bring people together to change hearts, minds, laws, policies, and practices so that things like restraint and seclusion can be reduced and eliminated in schools across the nation. But we're also very concerned about a lot of other things that are happening often to kids in the name of behavior. Uh, we see the kids are restrained, secluded, suspended, expelled, you know, corporal punishment. Uh, still is, is legal in 19 states. So we're very concerned about the things that are often happening in the name of behavior. And of course, at the end of the day, we really want to see safer schools for kids, teachers, and staff. So, you know, uh, I, I said, you know, was kind of talking recently about how foundational safety is for education. And a child that doesn't feel safe is not a child that can learn. Uh, a teacher that doesn't feel safe is not a teacher that can really appropriately teach. So, you know, we've got to look at the whole issue here to really make things better for all people uh, in our schools and in our other environments. So I'm thrilled today uh, to have actually returning uh, here to us, uh, Dr. Lori Desitels. Uh, Lori has actually been one of our most frequent guests here and one that I always get very, very excited about. Uh, Lori is an assistant professor at Butler University, uh, teaches both undergraduate and graduate programs. I'm going to tell you more about Lori in a few minutes. Uh, she also happens to be the author of several books, including uh, one of my favorites, and this has been a, a a uh, favorite of mine since uh, I was first lucky enough to read it, uh, Connections Over Compliance, but a lot of other great work as well. Uh, so, um, you know, with that, we're going to be talking to Lori. She's going to be talking to us today about the polyvagal theory uh, and how we can use that in, in our classrooms. And uh, I think it's going to be a great presentation. I do want to encourage people, you have the opportunity to ask questions at any time during the presentation today. So feel free to put those in the chat. Uh, may take me a few minutes to get to them, but I'll try to get to your questions uh, as we have an opportunity. Lori has agreed that as we present or as she presents today, I'm going to stick around and I might interject questions. I may, might bring up some of your questions as well. So we're going to have fun. We're going to make it kind of conversational. So there's a really good opportunity for you to get involved and uh, you know ask a lot of questions. If you're not able to watch the entire session today, uh, we are, as always, we record these sessions they're available on Facebook, on YouTube, and as an audio podcast. So you'll have an opportunity to go back and listen again. Or as I often recommend, share these. Absolutely, please share these with other parents, other educators, administrators, uh, whoever might be interested. And I think today is going to be one that you're definitely going to want to share. So with that, let me go ahead and bring uh, Dr. Lori uh, onto the screen here with me. And I'm going to introduce uh, Lori. So hello, Lori. Let me just kind of read through your introduction here. Um, you know, this is really exciting for me because um, I'm a huge fan of the work that you're doing. And, uh, you know, this has actually been a special week for me because I've gotten to see you now three times this week. Uh, I was able to join your uh, classes, your, your graduate classes on Monday and Tuesday, and here you are joining me on uh, Thursday. So really excited. Of course, you are very passionate about this work and, and engaging students really through neuroscience and, and thinking about attachment, regulation, educators, uh, brain and body state. Uh, and what I love about your work is it's focused on teaching students and staff about their neuro neuroanatomy and really kind of integrating that mind brain teaching uh, into the framework or the applied educational neuroscience framework. Uh, you have, uh, of course, conducted brain, um, conducted brain institutes and workshops throughout the United States, Canada, Costa Rica. I want to join you on that one next time. Dubai uh, on mind brain teaching and learning. Uh, you've created webinars uh, for educators, clinicians, administrators really illustrating how educators and students alike must understand their neuroanatomy to regulate their behavior and calm the brain. Uh, of course, you reside in uh, Indianapolis uh, with your husband and uh, three grown children. And according to this, four rescue fur babies. 
Uh, and I remember uh, earlier this week, I got to see one tail wagging, which excited me quite a bit. Uh, there's, there's obviously a lot more that I could say about you and your background, but Lori, welcome. And thank you so much for joining us today. Well, Guy, thank you for having me. And I'm just teary because um, I'm just grateful to be a part of this hour, hour and 15 minutes. And I'm tired too, in, it, in the best ways possible. Um, it's, it's the hardest, most challenging, and yet most rewarding time for us as parents and as educators and uh, social workers, counselors, all of us right now as we sit through this third pandemic year. So I'm just, thank you for what you do, how you connect people and organizations. And I'm just super excited to share this today. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. And and we couldn't be more excited. Uh, you know, I, the the excitement that hopefully people hear in my voice, um, you know, when when you come and join us, um, you know, it's based on a lot of things. You know, we've actually probably known each other for a couple of years now. And, uh, you know, I was so delighted when I had an opportunity to, to, you know, kind of initially connect with you and learn about your work. Um, but the the work that you've done um, and again, you know, you have been uh, an educator, special educator. You've you've taught at the, the university level. You've developed this amazing program about applied educational neuroscience. Uh, one of the great things about that for me has been the ability, and, and I really appreciate the invitation, but to, to join your classes and, and share information about restrained seclusion. And having that opportunity, I've met some amazing educators out there doing fantastic work. And at this point now, a number of them have have helped us in a number of ways from presenting and, and you know, actually just recently uh, we had Connie Persick on talking about functional behavioral assessments. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had Angie Zara on an event that we did recently uh, meeting with congressional representatives. Um, your work is uh, contagious in a very good way. You know, we find that there's, you know, these cohorts of people moving through your graduate program. And if you wouldn't mind, would you tell mm -hmm. people, because I know, and, and I think you know as well, we have a pretty diverse audience. We have, uh, you know, parents, um, we have educators, we have self-advocates, we have administrators, uh, we have a pretty broad group. Um, but your program that you offer, um, you know, especially for our educators, but but even others is is really amazing. If you wouldn't mind, I know we didn't talk about this, but I'm going to ask you to, to explain that a little bit and then we'll jump into your slide deck. Yeah, that, thank you guys. So, um, I'll open up the slide deck today um, with sharing that this framework, Applied Educational Neuroscience, is really talking about the nervous system as we parent, as we teach, as we work in an organization. It's about all of us. And it's about who we carry into the workplace. You know, what, what is my nervous system state? Um, as a mom, I would have been a different a parent to Andrew and Sarah and Reagan when they were younger. And I am a different mom today. So, you know, with my background in education, what I've learned is that this framework is transformational in all areas of our lives. And I think it's so interesting, the certification at Butler, as we have um, graduates go through and we have clinicians, we have teachers, administrators, we have parents. As they move through the certification, the common thread is that it has it has been healing and empowering for them personally and professionally. I think that's a big surprise as they move through these 11 months um, in this framework. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think, and again, I'm going to pull up your presentation here a second, but, you know, very often so much of the work out there, so much of the training out there um, mm -hmm. is focused on the child. And, and I say the child, just meaning children in general. And, you know, many times it's a focus of kind of what's wrong with the child. Um, and and your work really looks at the, the, you know, looks at children. It looks at teachers. Mm -hmm. It looks at parents. It looks at the important things that we're doing together versus, um, you know, kind of focused on, you know, focused on the outward behaviors or, or signals. So let me with that, pull up your presentation here and I'm going to let you take it away. You have given me permission to, uh, to update or rather interrupt periodically and, uh, yeah. you know, bring up questions. And we probably will have questions as we go through from the audience as well. I will tell you that we've already had people introducing themselves. And of course yeah. we do have some people from Indiana, but we also have people from, uh, looks like Canada, Massachusetts, uh, Texas, um, uh, the UK. Uh, so hopefully we'll have a great uh, group here today. 
So with that, if you would be so kind to take it away. All right. Well, Guy, thank you again. And so I'll go back to the first slide here. What we're going to look at this afternoon, and really it's just a brief, just kind of an overview of how polyvagal theory really informs the, this application of educational neuroscience in our schools and in our homes and in our communities. So as I move through this today, this these are my children, my adult children. And I place the slide in here because it's just what I said at the beginning. I, I parent differently and my relationships in my life and especially my relationship with myself has changed. I feel that um, I am more reflective and um, a little more patient. And something that you said, Guy, during class last week, trauma informed. When we think this has kind of become a buzzword and, um, you know, we have lots of definitions, but trauma informed, as you said, Guy, is not just about classrooms and students and teachers. It's about all of us. You know, it's about connecting those touch points with parents and our communities and organizations that serve our children and our youth. So as we move through this today, I really want you to think about your personal, not just professional roles, but your personal roles. Because these four pillars really, they don't stand alone, they blend. And polyvagal touches all of these. So it's been a hard day today. You know, I, I said that earlier, you know, staff, educators are exhausted right now, and we are seeing um, a social loss in our schools. And, and yet our policy leaders are talking about this academic loss. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're coming back in, you know, second semester of a third pandemic year. And what the science is sharing is that really behavior management and discipline are about the adult. It is about me as a mom. And this is what how I would have parented, I would have disciplined differently. It's about my awareness and intentionality to share my calm before I speak a word. Mm -hmm. That happens through my eyes. That happens through my gestures and my posture. And, and it's really being emotionally available to a child and modeling um, you know, that, that recognition of where I am in my nervous system. Mm -hmm. And so when we think about polyvagal theory, co-regulation as Deb Dana states so beautifully is our biological imperative. Mm -hmm. It's what we came into the world to do, to be, not to do, to be. We are social creatures. So we can't survive without each other. And this is why in this time in January of 2022, this social loss that we are all seeing that manifests in behavioral challenges is exhausting for our kids, for our parents, and for our schools. Mm -hmm. And guys, I'm so grateful for this alliance because seclusion and restraint go against the neurobiology of the developing brain and nervous system. Mm -hmm. You know, and go ahead. I was just going to say that, you know, just kind of on a, a, a slightly previous point that you made about um, it really resonated with me. And and uh, uh, from all I know and all I've seen, um, you know, and having actually had the chance to to meet one of your daughters, I, I can see what an amazing parent you are. But we're always kind of reflecting and thinking. And I know that as a father, um, I learned a lot on my my journey. You know, my my son, who is autistic, was my first child. And uh, I learned very early how important it was, how I approach situations or mm -hmm. how I might have reacted to something. And, you know, very early on, I learned a really important, um, you know, uh, set of guidance, that, which was really about how much influence my own emotions, reaction, all of that had. And, and the, the trick that I learned was to take a step back, to use a very calm voice, to you know be there to be supportive um and that may sound easy but you know as humans we can become escalated um but you know we do have the skills and the tools um more readily available and and more well developed than a child to to regulate 
And when a child's having a hard time, they really need our help with that, right? So, so I think about what you were saying, and, and what I think is that, you know, I think you and I both share this. It's this idea that when we know better, we do better. And and all of our, you know, a lot of us have that same journey. There are sometimes people that get stuck in what they're doing and and think in very punitive ways and whatnot. But I just wanted to relate that to, you know, I, I hear you and, and have gone through the same experience. I also wanted to pause for a second, if you could. Um, we had a really good question here, and I'm sure you're going to get into this a little bit more. Um, but as we delve into the polyvagal theory, uh, I have a Christina here that says an autistic person who has never heard of polyvagal. So I thought that, again, it'll probably happen throughout your presentation. But if we can give people just a, a general sense of where you're headed with polyvagal, you know, what is the polyvagal theory without getting too in depth, that might be helpful for people to kind of understand where we're coming from. A absolutely. So when we think of the polyvagal theory, we have this beautiful, it's, it's the, it's the largest vagus. It's, it's the largest nerve. It's a, cr the 10th cranial nerve that begins in the brain stem and it moves down through the body. And it really is called the wandering nerve because it wanders throughout the body and it impacts um, our organs. So it impacts our belly brain, it impacts our heart brain, and it impacts the skull brain. So poly meaning it has a lot of touch points. You know, this vagus nerve is really that bi-directional highway between our bodies and our brains. So I will talk about that. And I'm so glad that that was asked early on because um, this is something we're even teaching our young children that when we experience any type of um, condition or relationship, anything that we experience doesn't just happen in the brain. It, we feel it in our bodies. Right. right. And so that's why I love um, how this, this theory really ties into these four, these four pillars of the framework. Mm -hmm. and, and that moves us in this direction that I think is so critical, which is, uh, you know, people often respond, especially to children's mm -hmm. uh, behavior or emotions or whatever it may be, in, in coming with this perception that children are little adults and everything is a matter of intention and, and getting into the polyvagal theory, we begin to understand how our brains and body are wired and how so many things are kind of coming up from the bottom. They're, they're not necessarily these intentional thoughts, but, you know, getting back to, can, you know, things like safety, if we don't feel right. safe, you know, you know, the, you know, regulation before education idea, if we don't feel regulated, that whole idea or concept of getting people caught up, we can't do that until we get their nervous systems uh, under control, right. right? Okay, okay, great. Well, thanks for the explanation. I just wanted to make sure that people had nope. some foundation as we're, we're going through this. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I love the question. So Guy, please keep interrupting me. Um, okay. All right, so this fourth pillar is really exciting too, because I'm, I'm tired of talking about behaviors. I, I literally, we have been so behavior focused and centered for so long that we have forgotten that a behavior is just a signal of what is happening in the nervous system, my nervous system and a child or an adolescent. So this pillar is really teaching our children and our adolescents as in, in us, you know, we're learning it beside our children. We're learning about our neuroanatomy. And, and this is just so exciting because our kids are finding relief and they're feeling empowered to know that there's nothing wrong with me. I'm not a bad person. My brain and body are protecting me. When I feel my heart beat fast, when I start to sweat, when my hands get hot, when my mouth gets dry. And that's what we're teaching children right now. When you start to feel angry, when you start to feel anxious, when you start to shake, your body is actually working for you and not against you. And this is very, very empowering, um, especially when we look at what the Surgeon General just came out with in early December. You can access this document. It's his advisory report on the impact of COVID. Um, you know, on the mental and emotional health of our children and youth. And so I just share this today because we, again, tend to look at behaviors, but what's underneath that behavior is a nervous system that really is um, wired in an evolutionary way to protect us. 
And, and so it's not even realistic to think that we can always get regulated just like that. And, and what I, if you leave today with nothing more, I want you to really think about acknowledging the nervous system. It's not always about being regulated. It's acknowledging when you don't feel safe and when you don't feel felt in your environment. That in itself, that awareness actually moves us from protection to growth. So I wanted to share a couple of slides that I've shared before. These are a couple of years old, but they really are foundational. Mm -hmm. And that is to feel, you know, in any environment, you know, in my home, in my school, in my organization, and especially for children and adolescents as that brain develops from the back to the front and from the inside out, these two conditions drive well-being. And that is feeling safe and feeling felt. And when I travel into school districts and I go, you know, into organizations, um, this, this image right here is what I want to share with all of our policy leaders who are not getting it. When we're focusing on this academic or learning loss, we are ignoring and negating this social and emotional um, circuitry that happens through safety and connection. So down here in the brainstem, the brainstem is all about um, safety. And the language of the brainstem is sensation, and that's the language of our body. So in, in the midbrain region, in this area, um, you know, this is where after our heart starts to beat fast, we mobilize for energy either to protect and run or to protect and fight, or possibly even just to retreat and shut down. And then the limbic system, and again, I'm being very schematic if there are any neuroscientists on today. Um, the brain doesn't work like this as Dr. Perry always shares, but for our purpose today, as we integrate the polyvagal theory, the limbic system is a, is, holds the um, emotional mm -hmm. um, circuitry and much, much more than that. There's memory that happens there, but the limbic system is about feeling felt. And that's where the amygdala, which is our vigilance center, it's our brain's smoke detector resides. And once those areas are organized and integrated, then we can begin to learn. Then we can problem solve and we can pay attention and have strong working memory. So this is why when I, and oh, I forgot to share a guy, I'm in the classroom two days a week. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you're going to see today, I'm in a middle school this year and a large middle school in Indianapolis. And I, again, would have nothing to say if I weren't in the classroom. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is why we're sharing this, not only with teachers, but also with our students. Could I interrupt for a second just to get to a couple of comments and questions as we go along? Yeah. Um, I did have a, a follow-up question from uh, Christina who said, Dr. Lori, uh, could you send me information on the polyvagal theory? I'd like to show my boss and see if I can use it as an autistic person. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just kind of curious, and, and maybe after the show, if you can point you know, me towards some more resources, I'd be happy to share those. And, and I know you're always working on things, and I don't know if you're working on anything that might be of interest in this vein as well. So I absolutely will share resources. And, you know, with, um, so this is why this is just so helpful for our children on the spectrum too, because, you know, traditionally we um, tend to be talking heads, you know, in schools, you know, we use, we're cognitive heavy. Um, and, and it's true, I think sometimes as parents, you know, when we become worried or anxious, we tend to talk louder and faster. And for many of our children there, or who might be experiencing some sensory challenges, you know, we, we all um, will benefit when we tap into those sensory experiences that land in the body. Does that make sense, Guy? It, it does. And, you know, it, it kind of makes me think you, you mentioned you mentioned something really important in my mind and, and that relates, I think, to um, this and, and probably another question, and I'm sure you'll you'll get into this as well. But you talked about kind of our our internal smoke detector or alarm, um, mm -hmm. and, and I just guess I wanted to ask you this, and and maybe this is a question that that I, I have a good sense of, but but I think it'd be helpful for people to understand. 
Um, what might cause somebody to have an overactive alarm system or to be more likely to feel unsafe or th feel threatened? Uh, and, and does that relate to uh, disability or other things that um, might factor into kind of what we're talking about? So th that's a great question. And we will talk about that. Okay. But our brain and bodies, the nervous system has plasticity, meaning it changes. It, you know, it changes it, you know, based on the experiences that we encounter and our brains predict experiences based on past experiences. Mm -hmm. So a child or an adolescent who has experienced significant adversity in their life where they may not be, they may not have felt safe. They may not have, you know, consistently felt connected, um, are going to be sensitive to similar experiences that the brain perceives or the nervous system perceives as, um, you know, a threat or dangerous or unfamiliar. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is something that we need to remember. And that's why when we look at only a behavior, we're missing so much right. of, of what lies underneath that. But, but as you and I both know, that's a very common way of doing it in a lot of our educational settings. And, and I've even... Yeah. Uh, you know, I've quoted this many times, but I've even talked to uh, behavior folks that say, well, I don't care why it's happening. I just want to change the fact that it's happening. And, and, and I don't think that I don't think you can ever not care why something's happening. There, there's always oh. so much below the surface. Uh, a couple Absolutely. other um, comments here, and then I'll, I'll let you um, continue mm -hmm. on here. Uh, our friend Mandy uh, said, I'm tired of talking about behaviors. Me too. Uh, Gail Quigley, who's in Australia, and it's probably very early in the morning over there. Gail's one of the volunteers on our team. Uh, Gail said, so Dr. Lori, what are your thoughts on how neurodiversity interacts and manifests with in polyvagal thinking? Uh, this is part of my PhD research, so I'd love to hear your thoughts. Well, actually, I, I hopefully I, I will address that today, but I think it's just in perfect alignment because when we think of the three principles of polyvagal, we look at, first of all, the hierarchical states and, and, you know, going from kind of picturing a ladder, which I'll talk about. And so those autonomic states really drive the neurodiversity that we see that we oftentimes misunderstand. And then, and then the second principle driving polyvagal is co-regulation, which, you know, I mentioned earlier. And, you know, when we think about, um, you know, how important it is that connection piece um, that can happen. It has a thousand faces. The third principle of polyvagal is neuroception. And neuroception is our autonomic intuition. And so this is, this aligns, you know, with, with the neurodiversity of, um, you know, our child and adolescent and adult populations, because instead of classifying and ruling and labeling we are looking at the science and, and we're looking at the unique perceptual maps based on neuroception that our children and adolescents and we carry with us, sometimes with awareness and oftentimes without that awareness. Yeah. So as we think about trauma and adversity, it is body overwhelm. And it is when sensory information is coming in, you know, very quickly and it's overwhelming to all the systems, but the body holds on to that. The body is sticky to those experiences. And again, this is where polyvagal will, will really address, um, you know, how we can become activated by a smell, by someone's look on their face, by a, by a piece of clothing, um, we can get activated by something that we see and we don't have, it doesn't make sense to us, even as adults. And I see this in the classroom a lot and we misunderstand that. We just see a kid elope or we see a child mm -hmm. go under their desk or we see a sandwich thrown and we assume that's bad behavior. And, and, and that is, we've got to move away from that because this right here is sharing that the body remembers what the mind forgets mm -hmm. and there's it, it's it's pieces it's sensory and sensation is the language of the body and mm -hmm. of the brainstem so yeah, it, it always amazes me that 
that, um, you know, when, when there's issues that are occurring or a child's having a difficult time, um, that the, you know, the, the process that often is in place is one to begin by doing an assessment of the behavior before people really analyze the environment. And as we know, different people have different tolerances and sensitivities, especially when it comes to sensory input. And, and sometimes a, a condition can be hiding in plain sight. Uh, there can be something that's really difficult for an individual, um, but no one knows. And they look at the individual as separated from the environment. And that's so problematic, but it's so common. So I, yeah, I'd love to hear kind of as you're talking about this more, you know, how we get people to really think about that. Well, I think I, from, from my experience, I think we start to really think about that when we apply it in our own lives. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and this is really, really foundational. When we begin, and that's why the adult nervous system, the very first pillar, you know, really is that significant. We have schools and districts focusing on just the adult nervous system, the staff in the school, the staff in the organi organization, so that we can begin to understand what cold or teary or tired or tense or scattered or icy or throbbing feels like in our bodies. And when we really engineer and, and really are intentional about identifying our sensations, and these are physicalized feelings, kids get this. They can draw what jittery looks like. They can draw and give me a color for numb. Um, and they love to do it. They can, you know, show what open or flowing. So these are when you identify and when you can acknowledge the sensation and I'll, you, I'll do this so many different ways. I'll bring in a big tray of objects with a pine cone, with um, a nail file, with a cotton ball. And then, I mean, I do it so many ways or just images for, you know, children that um, aren't able to read these words. You know, we have just visual images. And then we talk about our belly brains. We talk about our heart brains. We talk about how the vagus nerve is always working for us, but sometimes we don't put the brake on. And, and so I'm probably getting ahead of myself. So I'll share that. I'll share that too. Um, one of the things I, I always love to, you know, as we think about, um, the behaviors that we're seeing right now. This was in 2000, and I love this quote. Mm -hmm. Emotionally challenged children have learned to associate adult intervention with adult rejection. And this is troubling because our goal, when we focus on the adult brain state and we think about co-regulation, is to really reinterpret adult intervention as an act of protection rather than an act of hostility. And, and this was, again, from Dr. Nicholas Long and uh, uh, Frank Fesser and Dr. Robert Morse from the University of Michigan. So this has been something I shared this morning. And we had a lot of staff this morning in our middle school that were just not buying in. I mean, it was just, and I pulled up the slide and I just shared that we can empathize with a student who walks in with a cast on or who's bandaged up, you know, from an injury or a wound. But what we misunderstand is that our children and adolescents who've experienced significant adversity, anxiety, that they're struggling emotionally, have this inflammation in the brain. And we thought the brain was immune to, immune to inflammation mm -hmm. until 30, 40 years or maybe even, I mean, it's been recent, 40 years is not very long in science. And we know that when our bodies and brains are producing an excess of cortisol and adrenaline, it keeps us spinning in those lower brain regions. And, and so this is almost an invisible epidemic this year. The behavioral challenges are showing up and they look disrespectful or oppositional or defiant, or they look, they look shut down and collapse. But what we're seeing, we can't see the inflammation in specifically the midbrain regions. And, and something else that, um, and again, I didn't even thank Dr. Porges and Deb Dana and everybody at the Polyvagal Institute, um, you know, for, um, helping me and sitting beside me 
learning this work and aligning this um, with applied educational neuroscience. But we now understand too that, that generational trauma, racialized trauma, institutional, historical trauma is a significant part of some of the um, pain that we as adults and our children are carrying into our organizations and our schools. And, and this is important to really recognize as an adverse childhood experience. It's an mm -hmm. adverse, it becomes an adverse community experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you mentioned, you know, kind of thinking about, you know, what happens when a child is bringing in trauma, what happens, you know, going back to the biology of it, you know, the, the thinking about the kind of the, the inflammation, thinking about the trauma, thinking about the result, you know, we were talking about uh, during your class earlier this week, kind of the idea that it becomes a cycle because kids that are exhibiting these behaviors that are thought to be intentional and disrespectful. Uh, I, I hear the words violent sometimes uh, thrown around and, and I really get upset because many times those are stories about five, six, seven, and eight-year-olds who I don't think are intentionally trying to, to inflict yeah. any pain. But but when that happens then, and then they are, the kids are on the other side of punitive approaches, it mm -hmm. creates more distress, more trauma, uh, the child feeling, you know, less sense of self-worth, less sense of engagement. So, you know, I mean, the, the potential is the snowball effect, right? That you can start off and of course, being in this challenging year, having everybody having been through this pandemic, it's the start of a snowball in a way that if we if we're not responding appropriately and understanding stress, things can get worse, couldn't they? Yeah, absolutely. And that's why the awareness and acknowledging when you are dysregulated is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have said that a year ago. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize the impact of the awareness and the acknowledgement, mm -hmm. because when we are aware of that and again, that begins with us. And in and, and learning, you know, just really understanding, we may not ever know about our generational, um, the challenges that, you know, our generations before us had, but um, we know that these are chains of pain that can be broken. Right, right, and, right. And that's what this next slide is really talking about. Yeah, and we, that, that, that makes me think about, you know, people like Bruce Perry. And, and you know, I'm thinking about the, the, the latest book, you know, What Happened to You? And, and yeah. even some, even an adult, reframing from what's wrong with you, why are you doing this to what mm -hmm. happened to you? How can I support you is such a ch huge shift, but, but very often that's not the approach. Um, it's, it's punitive, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and those questions, you know, what happened to you and what didn't happen, right? You know, that's right. something that we want to add to right. that too. Right. And so this, you know, when we think about, um, you know, our nervous systems, we all hold stories. Um, our store, you know, our nervous systems hold stories of our past experiences and generations before. But the, the fabulous news, and this is what my new book is about, is moving and really thinking about the plasticity of the nervous system, which polyvagal theory, you know, also addresses. So, you know, acknowledging and understanding um, that it's you haven't done anything wrong. And you're, you know, it's it's not just about the behavior. It's not even just about your feelings. It's what's underneath that. Mm -hmm. So it really is um, the resiliency research is so hopeful because the resiliency research, which is 50 plus years old, says that even if children or adolescents return to environments that carry toxic levels of stress, one emotionally available, consistent, predictable adult can help a child or an adolescent overcome that even generational trauma and that story of adversity. Mm. So again, this is what I, I kind of got ahead of myself, but co-regulation is one of the organizing principles. And boy, this is about discipline in our schools. If co-regulation is our biological imperative, the longing to connect needs to be a part of our drive. It is a part of our drive to survive. So it's gotta be a part of our discipline protocols. And this is a huge mind shift for the adults to make. It's hard to stay connected through a conflict. Mm -hmm. but it, it, it's, it's, it's critical. Neuroception is 
how it's we don't there's no cognition we don't we don't detect consciously neuroception is intuition it is scanning our environments at an unconscious level for anything that feels unsafe threatening or unfamiliar so you'll see in the powerpoint i may not get to all the slides today but instead of having behavior check-ins we are beginning to create nervous system check-ins so that we're really sharing the language of the nervous system. And then when we look at the hierarchy, the third principle is the hierarchy of states. And, you know, again, coming from the cortex, which is our social engagement, ventral vagal, fight flight, um, where the amygdala is firing, is sympathetic, and dorsal vagal state is at the bottom. And that is has been known as um, our freeze response, but more specifically, it is an immobilized collapsed response. So just as I said, all of us carry these trauma stories in our nervous system states and, and they show up when we have autonomic dysregulation. So I love this picture and I share, this is a slide I share um, with my students and will continue to share with them. So if you think of a ladder and we start at the bottom of the ladder, um, the and, and think about, um, you know, the brain is built from back to the front and from the inside out. So this dorsal vagal is a reptilian response. And and but it's also it's not just a negative pathway. The dorsal vagal is 500 million years old and it's the place of again, the brainstem and the body are about safety. And so that dorsal vagal brings states of immobilization. It's like if we can't run from our stress and we can't fight it off, then we have a neurobiological um, way of retreating. And, and so Dr. Porges calls this the state of disconnection. It's where we disconnect ourselves so that um, we can, you know, we can move away from that danger. And again, this is not oftentimes a conscious state. We see this in our schools. We've seen this autonomic state um, with kids, uh, hoods over heads, heads down, high absences, not logging on. Last year, we had so many children and adolescents who couldn't access technology. And so it was just, the, I mean, you just, your body wants to give up. Work not being completed in our schools, assignments not being turned in. When I went into my science class two weeks ago, there was a sub in the room and I had not been in that class only but maybe one other time. So I didn't have a relationship with those students. And I would say out of 18 students, 16 heads were down. It's a dissociative state. Just, you know, it's, it's that. We can be scrolling on our phones to, for hours, and that is kind of a shut down, immobilized state. Um, so again, I don't want to generalize, but as we move up the ladder from dorsal, then we move into fight flight. And this is kind of like fish darting around. And you know, our body is mobilizing for energy. And this is the sympathetic pathway. Um, where our heart rate goes up, our respiration goes up, and our blood pressure can go up. And this pathway works well for us in acute stress. And it works well for us when we need to mobilize for energy. And one of the things I want to share today, Guy, is that oftentimes we're not just in one autonomic state, that we can be in blended states. And so I'll, I'll, as we move up the ladder, um, and let me go to this safe ventral vagal, I need solitude in my life and I'm more of an introvert. And so when I need to take a walk, I need to get away. I want to go have my coffee. I don't want to talk to anyone. I am in my cortex. I'm up in ventral vagal in my social engagement system, but I'm also in dorsal shut down a little bit. And so that's that's a good thing. And, and so we can be like our kids can be excited to go out to recess or all of us could be excited for something we've planned over the weekend. We can be in fight flight and be enthusiastic and have a ton of energy. And we can also be in ventral vagal. 
which is we liken that to the prefrontal cortex. So I, I want us to think about not just definitive states, but that we move, you know, our stories of our nervous system and how we're feeling in our bodies and brains change. It's when we get stuck in a state that that becomes really problematic. Do you want to add anything, Guy, before I share this chart? Uh, no, no. I, I was just, I was just kind of reflecting on what you were saying, and uh, uh, you know, I, I also kind of consider myself a little bit more introverted, even though we might have kind of roles that people think of otherwise. And uh, you know, I was just pondering, Lori, you're so busy. Where you get that time to uh, make sure that you're you're charging your battery, and how you know how you um, also, uh, you know, stress the importance of that to the educators and others that you're working with, because when, when we're, we're not able to uh, kind of do that, um, it takes a toll on us. So I was just kind of curious if you had thoughts on that. I do. And I, I, I'm telling you, I, we all are so busy right now, but if I didn't have 20 minutes or even 10 minutes once a day to do a focused attention practice. Mm -hmm. And I choose during the middle of the day to do, it's called yoga nidra. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's literally where you do a body scan and I lay mm -hmm. down to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, everyone teases me in my house because when I say I'm going to go do a focused attention practice, I'm going to go meditate. Um, Nellie, our dog goes with me. I couldn't get through the rest of the day. I did that before I came on today. Uh -huh. so, oh, very good. Very good. Minutes. Yeah. I, I think we've got to not think of big things. You know, we don't have time right. to take a, you know, uh, sometimes a 45 minute walk or go to the gym, but we have, we can find 10 minutes mm -hmm. and, and, and that's really critical. Um, this, what I just explained this whole kind of, this is, we, we re redid this polyvagal chart. And so um, I'm really excited about how um, we're using this in the schools and we're using this. You could use this in your home. I would have used this with Andrew Saren Reagan. So we, we know that our autonomic nervous system has two pathways. We've got the sympathetic and then the parasympathetic and this parasympathetic up at the top ventral pathway is that's where our court are we're functioning, you know, pretty much from our prefrontal course text, we can access, we can feel peaceful and relaxed and motivated. And then we get activated or we get a trigger. And you can see, you know, we might get a text or a phone call from the school as a parent, or, you know, we might become irritated or worried or anxious. And we can feel if we are self aware, we can feel our bodies start to change. Not really what we're thinking, but we can feel our bodies change. And so there in this state, our, we're moving. So you could, your heart rate goes up, respiration, blood pressure goes up, and we're mobilizing. Um, you know, we're feeling some anxiety. We might feel just some anger. And, and, it, and if we don't, sometimes if we're not addressing it, it can turn into rage. And, and this is where, you know, I will have teachers that will email me or, you know, um, administrators and say, okay, we've got this kid that, you know, is running out of the room and what do we, what do you do? Or, you know, he's just, you know, thro like throwing chairs. And I'm like, at that point, um, you know, there's not a lot we can do, you know, at that point we're down here in mm -hmm. this area, in this rage. And so that's where, you know, we've got to give it some time and, and then we've got to learn from that experience and, and meet the students where they are. Um, this down here is that immobilized brain stem, immobilized shutdown state. And that's where um, it is also, a, that's also a parasympathetic response, the nervous system pathway, it's a parasympathetic pathway, but our blood pressure and our respiration slow down to a point where that's not sustainable reptiles can live in this immobilized collapsed state human beings cannot hmm. and so i i was sharing this week that i would much rather see a child in in rage popping off and spazzing hmm. than i would see a child completely shut down hmm. and hmm. and not engaged and hmm. sitting under the desk not i mean just, that is for me it, and you can see it's a much bigger, um, that's a, that's a much larger area. Mm -hmm. 
for regulation. You, you know, I can't help but think, uh, you know, and I think you and I have talked about this before, but um, one of the things that we, we see in the work that we do is that sometimes uh, kids are put into seclusion spaces under this idea that they're going to go in there and calm down and, and regulate. And, you know, a kid goes in there and, you know, again, seclusions by force, you know, they're, they're forced in there. They're in a rage state. They're, they're screaming. They're trying to get out. And after 15 or 20 minutes, they melt into the, the corner of the room and people say, oh, they've calmed down. They've not calmed down. They've, they've entered right. into that collapse state. And, and like right. you said, I mean, that, that's a really bad place to be, but, but it's often mistaken for, oh, well, they calm down. Oh. Oh, no, 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 no. You, you've, you've shut down their brain that this has been yeah. so stressful. Um, I also was thinking about, um, you know, part of what is so amazing about what you teach, you know, both in, in you know, elementary schools and, and your graduate courses are, are really how people can connect to this, how they can connect to their own brain and body state. And, and I'm, I'm taken back to our, our discussion earlier this week when uh, I shared the short video from uh, Zamaya, who was a third grader at a school that you had been working and how she began to be able to recognize the signs of her, her state changing and, and learn the strategies to help bring herself back if she was beginning to feel upset yeah. or angry or, or, and, and, you know, Zamaya was such a amazing uh, young lady. And, uh, you know, I remember she was saying how she was sharing that with her, her family. Uh, wow. Mm -hmm. What impact, what impact when, when we're no longer, you know, kind of, I, I hate to say victims of our, our, you know, rage or whatever it may be, but we can take a very active role if we begin to understand how that works. And, if, if, you know, uh, a third, fourth grader is able to kind of understand these concepts uh, as adults, you know, we've, we've got to be able to do this as well because, you know, kids need our help, right? A, a, a dysregulated kid needs our help to, to reach regulation. They need that co-regulation. They need to borrow our, our prefrontal cortex. Um, so I, I just think about that. And I love the impact of what you're doing, both with adults and, and children of that work. Well, thank you, Guy. And something that you said, um, I'm going to skip a couple of these. I want to just because I, I have enough slides for us to be literally doing this for, like I always say, two days. But well, no, no one would stop us. We can just do a an old fashioned telethon. Okay. <laughs> well, so one of the things that, um, and this really, this slide, sh you know, shares that too, is that Co-regulation is also an embodied experience shared between two people. It's one thing to tell somebody that water is good for you. It's another to join up with them and to share in that bottle of water. And that is that's something I've learned over, especially last year and this year in the classrooms. We last year just we, we had breakfast with the kids. We didn't just walk around and check homework in. Um, we really created those first 10 to 15 minutes where we we were joining them in breakfast. We were creating those touch points. And mm -hmm. so this this really this is our assistant principal, Tiasha. And um, and we you know, we have so our kids are learning when they start to really rage. And um, and so they um, Tiasha and this little girl have this agreement that when she starts to feel her heart beat fast and when she starts to get sweaty, she gets Tiasha and they do a an embodied, um, they have an embodied experience of co-regulation through movement. And I Tiasha sent this to me and this is it. This is discipline. And, and so what is this, you know, what are we learning? We are teaching our children not only to recognize how they're feeling in their bodies, but also to know what to do. And this is, a, this is an endurance event. You know, we as teachers and as parents, we want quick fixes. We want strategies. We want solutions. We want to fix it. And, and the brain and body don't work that way. It takes patterned, repetitive moments like this. Um, to begin to change brain architecture. And, and, and I just think this is, um, it's, it's just so powerful. 
The other thing that we're using in the classrooms, and I just looked at the time, so I just want to make sure I share some of these practices. Sure. Can, can um, I interrupt real quick? I, I started to say something and realized I was on mute. I thought, well, Lori's just keep, she just kept on going. <laughs> uh, what, what I was going to bring up, um, it's just something really important to that last point. Um, you mentioned in Connections Over Compliance, something that, that really um, resonated with me and I think many others, and I can see a comment here that, that gets to the same point. Uh, you talked about, you know, the, the disciplines really about teaching. Uh, you know, here uh, in much of the world, we think about discipline as consequence, as doing something mm -hmm. to someone, but you really reframe discipline. It, it's about teaching. And I remember you talking about the root word and this, the cycle and, and, and all of that. Uh, but I think that's a shift that many people haven't made. So when you talked about this being discipline, you know, people are probably like, well, what do you mean it's discipline? It's teaching, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and, yeah. and it looks like we, we had some agreement here from uh, Kristen who said discipline is as learning and growth. You know, that's really yeah. where the, one of the shifts we need to make, right? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Guy, for making that point. And the other thing I, I want, you know, I want us to think about too is, you know, we as parents, and I'm generalizing, and we as, you know, educators or in organizations that work with youth, we are so, we're so consumed with consequences. And this, I talk about this in Connections Over Compliance too, and I will talk about it in my next book, but what if we replaced the word or substituted the word consequences for the word experiences? Because experiences teach. You know, and and I, I thought about this as a mom so many times. I, I wish that I had provided experiences for my children to really, um, you know, to model and to really think about and, um, you know, and, and just to process in new ways. And this is what our assistant principal is, is doing here. She's providing an experience um, for this beautiful young girl so that she can begin to use her nervous system in ways that help her to find her way home, meaning to find that balance. So that's that's just, you know, it's just so critical. Um, as we've talked about neuroception, I liken it to a volume knob. And this is another great way for us to check in with our kids and to check in as a staff and as a family. And, and this takes no time. So let's, again, move away from these behavioral check-ins. Since this is our autonomic intuition and this, this term was coined by Dr. Porges. It works outside of our awareness and it operates without thought. And it listens to our embodied meaning how we're feeling in our bodies. Because sometimes, you know, we we don't pay attention if we've got a stiff neck. I mean, it, our bodies do keep the score, but sometimes we don't listen. So if I, my stomach is hurting, if, um, you know, I'm I'm just, you know, feeling tired. My eyes feel um, puffy. So neuroception is paying attention not only to what's out in our environment, to, but what's inside of us. That's what I mean by embodied. And it's also paying attention to our relational experiences. There are some people that just don't feel good to us and we can't put our finger on it. And, and this is true for all of us, but just something about their smell, their look, their tone, their piece of clothing cues danger. And, and we all need to be aware of this because the nervous system is constantly signaling safety and cueing safety or signaling danger. So when kids come in, um, and you could do this a thousand ways, they can check in with a volume number. So if you're if you're feeling pretty safe and pretty connected, you know, you've got a volume down there of zero, one, two. And if you're feeling really rough, as we say in our house, you're up at an eight, nine, or 10. And you can explain it if you want to, but you don't have to. Mm -hmm. So I, I would love to see what parents and advocates and educators could do with this, because I think this is a wonderful substitute for these behavior check-ins mm -hmm. that um, we almost, I mean, they've just become... Um, they're not even meaningful at this mm -hmm. point. Anymore. Is there a lesson there as well for adults? And, and what I'm thinking is that, you know, you kind of talk about, you know, uh, having a sense of someone or, uh, and, and I'm thinking about um, experiences and I'm thinking about trauma. And, you know, there may be times where for no 
no apparent reason a child might have a difficult time with a certain individual. And it can come down to something very minor. Uh, maybe that individual reminds them of an abusive situation they were in. Absolutely. Maybe that person wears an aftershave or cologne that reminds them of somebody. I'm thinking yeah. about uh, you know, Dr. Perry's work. Um, and, and as adults, do we need to really learn not to take things personally? I mean, you know, sometimes maybe, you know, for whatever reason, even if it's not anything that that is reflective on the person that that the, the child may be having difficulty with, um, you know, if there's another person they can connect with, isn't that a lesson that we need to be able to, to, yeah. 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 yeah guy, I'm so glad you brought that up because that's where the, we get, we jump into these power struggles and we right. get inside these conflicts and we don't, we didn't wake up wanting to do that, but because at, we can feel our nervous systems rub up, right. um, we do tend to take it personally. Right. And, you know, and sometimes it touches on our own unfinished psychological stuff. Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes, right. I see this a lot right now that our neuroception, we can jump into a conflict because maybe it doesn't feel good day after day to work hard for a child or an adolescent. And, and, you know, and you feel like you're not, you're not moving forward with them. You know, mm -hmm. you're not making strides. Mm -hmm. Um and it wears everybody down. So there, I love Dr. Nick Long um, talked about um, staff counter aggression and, you know, how they identified in the early 2000s, um, seven reasons why, you know, staff can become counter aggressive because mm -hmm. we misinterpret these, you know, these behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to share this today, too. These are my... Um, my great niece and my great nephew, and this was, they were about 10 weeks old here. And this just shows you, Laura, their mother, mother sent me this. And it just shows you that as if, you know, even at 10 weeks old, when we have had experiences of co-regulation, we know how to do this at 10 weeks old. And Avery on the right is just crying, was crying hysterically. And Laura just needed a deep breath. The mother so she laid Avery down and you can see Brooke, Brooke's looking at her and then Brooks grabs her hand and she quits crying immediately. And so this is the biological imperative of the polyvagal system. Fast forward a year, there's Avery. She's lost her passy and look at Brooks. He hands it to her. You can see the exchange here. They are sharing, they are joining up and there it is. You know, that is co-regulation and, and we know how to do this. Um, and, and so we, we can really sense, I, I love what Dr. Jill Bolte Taylor says. She says, we are feeling and sensing creatures who think we are not thinking creatures who feel. And the polyvagal theory addresses that, that our neuroception and that biological imperative are critical. This is discipline right here. This is my former graduate student, Jason Smith. And um, he, as an assistant principal in this image, was called down to deal with um, the so-called defiant oppositional behavior of um, this, this student. And so this student took himself out of the room, threw himself in the hall, and Jason joined up with him. This is co-regulation. This is discipline. When you share your calm, he's not looking at him. He's not talking to him. And we are sharing our emotionally available nervous system so that we can both get to the cortex. It's not just the child, but we can both get to the cortex. I love that. I love that image. I mean, that image, you know, even gives me a, a, a kind of helps helps me to feel more regulated. I mean, just looking at that uh, and and thinking about that against what so often happens. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, I I agree, guy. I mean, I, I you just it it's so important, and I and I just I I want us to think too that co regulation is is about us as human beings. But co-regulation is also about the setting. We forget to ask our students, where in the school, what, what feels, is there a place in the school that feels safe to you? Now, I always, you know, I think of what you share, Guy, about Cooper and that word safety. Now, I'm, when I say that word, I'm thinking, ah, 
But, mm -hmm. you know, is there a setting that feels good to you? Are there adults that you trust? We can't take that personally because maybe the, the student feels safe and connected, not with us, but maybe there, maybe there is um, office staff or there is an instructional assistant or there may be custodial staff. You know, it, it takes all of us. So co-regulation is about the space. It's about the setting. And, and, and it may not be just because they are in our classroom. There may be other adults in that building that have that ability to share their calm, too. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, again, and I love this quote. Many of you have probably seen this. The capacity for us to um, have that emotional regulation is born out of hundreds and hundreds of instances of being soothed by someone else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I wrote these questions down. Um, when we do get to the cortex, when we are, when we put a kind of put that break on the vagus nerve, these questions are gentle. And these questions can be heard when we are slowly moving through that hierarchy of autonomic states. What do you need me to understand? You know, what am I not hearing or understanding? How can I help you to feel safer? What feels unfair or unjust? Now, again, we're not gonna ask these um, in the heat of the moment, but as we, you know, as you saw in that picture with Jason, you know, once we, you know, have shared and we, we are really working towards that co-regulation in our bodies. I'm not going to, well, I am going to share this just for a second because this is pretty cool, but that is exciting. Then we can begin to, when we access the cortex, we can begin to really um, learn more about what that child is sensing and feeling and what they might need. This is a hot mess but it's a really good hot mess. So I'm gonna work on making it not so detailed, but the conflict cycle was developed by Dr. Nick Long in um, the eighties, I think, or now I forgot, late eighties or early nineties. And so I went to life space crisis intervention and I shared this because the, the conflict cycle that was originally created is genius, but it leaves out generational, racialized, institutional, and historical trauma that become a part of our neuroception. It leaves out neuroception. It does not, it only talks about thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And we, our neuroception drives our, I'll use my mark, drives our autonomic nervous system state, which drives our perception and drives our thoughts and feelings. And the conflict cycle is about not just the students. We have a conflict cycle that we've got to be aware of and address. So when there is a stressful incident, it's not just about our kids. I could have always done this better. And, and even if I don't think that I could have, I, I wanna model that for my students. And, and actually I could always do it better. So these, this conflict cycle is not, the, the original one was set up and it just was talking about student behavior. What we've added to this is the adult behavior. And so at the top, you can see that we're no different from our kids. Our generational and community adversities and our embodied lived experiences drive our neuroception, which drives our autonomic state and our perception and thoughts and feelings. Now at the bottom, and Guy, you'll love this. Angie Zare and I worked on this together. Hmm. Um, and she's so good at, poor, I mean, I told, I, like I drew it on a piece of paper, old fashioned, and then she, she got it. So down here at the bottom is the, this is what we can now do. You know, we know that regulatory practices matter. And, and when we meet a child from the bottom up, when we address what they need, do they need heat right now? Do they need cold? Do they need to move? Do they need to breathe deeply? Do they need to hold something? Do they need to take a walk? When we address the regulatory practice that they need, then we can get to the thoughts and feelings, and then we can begin to respond through co-regulation and we move to post-adversity growth. Mm -hmm. 
So it looks like a lot right now. And Angie and I are, I think I'm going to have to clean it up a little bit, but I just didn't want to leave anything out. And this is a significant part. This is a beautiful blend of polyvagal and also of applied educational neuroscience. So as we, and I know we don't, we've got just, um, you tell me, guy, just like what, in about 10 minutes. Sure, sure. 10, 10 minutes. And, and you know, um, it'd be great if we could have a couple minutes for questions, but um, yeah, I, I will let you go as long as you're willing to go. <laughs> well, <laughs> don't, don't feel rushed by me, but I would like to allow a couple minutes for any final uh, questions. Yeah, have. let's do that. So okay. this is um, this is in the book to the, the um, connections over compliance, but there is a significant difference. Um, and this, again, is about polyvagal and applied educational neuroscience between co-regulation and coercive regulation. And over when you look at your screen over on the right, this is traditional discipline. And you've heard, I've said this, you know, so many times before that traditional discipline works the best with the kids who need it the least. Mm -hmm. And it works the least with the kids who need it the most. So this is a big difference. And you'll notice that the difference between co-regulation and coercive regulation is paying attention to the adult nervous system first and my sensations and awareness. And I, this is not my term, and I can't think of who came up with this, but being a warm demander. Um, the brain needs structure. The brain thrives on predictability and routine. So when we are joining up which is co-regulation with our children and our adolescents, it doesn't mean that you're doing away with routine and predictability. Um, it's really paying attention to your nonverbal communication while you set those boundaries. We have this tiny ear muscle called the stapedius muscle um, that's less than a millimeter that is connected to that 10th cranial vagus nerve and that little ear muscle when we are under stress, that muscle changes to change our hearing. Mm -hmm. So in a simplistic way, it expands almost, it has plasticity so that we can pay attention to everything around us. And this is what we misunderstand. This can look like ADD, attention deficit disorder. This muscle protects us so we can't focus on a singular conversation. And so when that only, only when that muscle constricts, can we focus on a conversation, be redirected, and hear what is being said to us. Co-regulation is absorbing and draining off a child's negative emotions through supportive and open um, nonverbal communication. And this is from Dr. Nick Long, being that thermostat mm -hmm. instead of that thermometer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, this is, you can see there's just kind of a combination. And this is just, I, I wanted to give everybody a nice visual as we think about polyvagal because, poly, you know, we, the autonomic nervous system has these two distinct pathways and they affect every system in the body. So that vagus nerve is tied to our eye muscles, our hearing, our vocalization, and our heart, as I've said. And it, you know, and then down to um, our bellies. And I won't get into the intricacies because we don't have time. Um, but just knowing that our body sends sensory, about 80% of the information goes from the body to the brain in our through sensory, um, through sensory projections, and only 20%, once it's reached the brain, then the brain tries to make sense of all that sensory mm -hmm. information. And only 20% goes back down to the body. Oops, I had that in there two times. So, you know, as we kind of wind down tonight, this is what we're sharing with our children is that our autonomic nervous system is a, it's our platform. Um, it's our biological superpower. And it's where our stories are, our nervous system stories are. And because it's our bodies and brains are always communicating, they're working for us. So I want my six-year-olds and five-year-olds and nine-year-olds and 12-year-olds and 15-year-olds to begin to listen to what their bodies are saying mm -hmm. to them, because when they do, then they know what they need. And that is discipline. And, and so the polyvagal theory 
is responding to the student's nervous system. And always, it's not about behavior. Our nervous systems drive us in all moments because we're detecting safety or threat. Education requires state regulation. And mm -hmm. we're not taught about this developmental component in our training, in our, in our pre-service, in our um, higher ed. And a regulated nervous system is prepared for cognitive and mental tasks. So ANDS, we have created ANDS in our classrooms and we are befriending ANDS. ANDS is they. And so as we, I'm gonna skip a couple more because I wanna show you, oh my goodness, there's just so much, but I wanna show what we're doing with ANDS. This is the stapedius muscle. Hold on. I, okay, so this is what I wanted to share. So um, our students are, they're really um, kind of tracking their nervous system state. So this mm -hmm. is second grade. So they're, you know, they're sharing and they're putting up, am I above the line, on the line or below the line, thinking about the polyvagal graph. This is, this came to me this week. <clears throat> A teacher sent her middle school students we're talking about their autonomic state. So the students personalized their nervous system stories and they drew pictures of what their dorsal, when, when they feel shut down and collapsed, how, what that nerve, what they feel like in their bodies. And you can see this. And then they did the same thing with ventral. Oops. And I skipped over here is sympathetic to your right. So you can see fight, flight, shut down. And then they shared how their nervous systems are, you know, you know how they're experiencing through line, through shape, through color. And this is a check-in. And Dan Siegel says this, you know, this guy, what you can name, you can tame. What mm -hmm. you can share, you can bear. The other thing that's really cool is that we're also having kids check in with writing their first name, which really enforces their identity. You know, we need to be proud of our names. Our names are given to us and they are unique. So we had our students write their names in each of the autonomic states. If you can, this is second grade again. So I did this, this, I did this last week with um, my seventh grade uh, students and I, you know, Dr. Laura, I wrote mine. So when I'm in my prefrontal cortex, when I'm in that ventral vagal social engagement, my letters are big and loopy. When I'm in sympathetic, they're sharp, they're angular and dark. And when I'm in shutdown, they're just tiny. I want to disappear. I want to retreat. So this is a great way um, at home, in our schools, to have kids. And then one of our students said, you know, Dr. Lori, we can just put out on our desk when we get in the morning or when we come in in the morning and through the day, we can just put our card out. So um, our teacher knows how we're feeling in our hands. And, you know, I love that. Here are a couple examples you can use at home of, of the polyvagal graph. You can see they're, they're simple, but these students are checking in um, and sharing how they're experiencing their brain and their body. And th these teachers have sent their own creation of this to me. The last one, and then we'll, I'll take questions. Um, this is Anne's. And we laminated this. And so the kids can actually use color, shape, and sensation words. And they can share how they're, you know, as a check-in throughout the day, at the end of the day, at the beginning of a class period, um, you know, middle school, high school, elementary. We even did this with, um, we had Indian or, uh, Indiana school counselors track with this, their nervous system state for two days. So this young woman, um, actually was just coming off of a physical fight and I had just walked in. And so she, I brought this to her, I brought hers to her and, and she was sharing how she was feeling fuzzy in her brain. Her ears were burning. Her heart was e beating everywhere. Hands were hot and her feet couldn't sit still. Mm -hmm. So this is, I, this is, um, I'll stop there guy, because I want to make sure that we, oops, that we answer questions. I could, there's so much to share, but I, I feel like this will give, I'm hoping I gave some practical strategies that we can be mm -hmm, using mm -hmm. in our classroom, 
um, to address the nervous system rather than the behavior. That's great. That's great. Uh, and this has been fantastic. And and as you um, probably know, I might say, uh, you know, um, we always welcome you back. So knowing, knowing that you have more we didn't get to, uh, mm -hmm. it's just another reason for me to send you an email later and go, thank you so much. Hey, you want to come back? Um, so <laughs> thank you for, for sharing this. We do have a couple questions that are popping up. Uh, and, and before we get to the questions here, I'm going to ask you one of mine. Uh, and, and I, you, you, I think you were kind of getting there in getting one there. of your last slides, but I'm kind of curious, you know, um, knowing that some people, this could be their first exposure to thinking about polyvagal. So what is the high level take home you would want a, an educator or a parent to, to take home with them about polyvagal, the polyvagal theory? So I, it, I think that in, in two sentences, this theory is about how our nervous system senses and feels and experiences the world around us. Mm -hmm. And our nervous system is always protecting us. And even though we might get a headache or a stomach ache or a heart beats fast, that is our body and our brain's way of, again, protecting us and telling us what we need. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, our oldest son, Andrew, is going to have a physical tomorrow at the doctor. And he literally, his blood pressure will rise. Mm -hmm. um, and it has been high all week just thinking about this visit. He is so fearful of going. And so our nervous system cannot tell the difference between the actual event and us even thinking about right, something. Right, right. So that's the takeaway. I guess that was more than two sentences, but it really is the communication between our brains and bodies and knowing that it's working for us and not against us. It has plasticity. And, and there's the recognition phase of recognizing this is yeah. happening, being better connected. And, and then right. there's the what we can do about it, um, which, of course, a lot of your work goes into. I think about, uh, you know, your book here that's in front of me and all the different things that you uh, provide as, as things that t educators can actually do. Uh, the last half of that book has has a lot in it. Um, so and, and I might bring you back to that in a second. But let me get to a couple of questions here. Um, mm -hmm. th this question um, is from a parent and, you know, basically talks about having a child at home with a serious injury and trauma and then ask about how to find placement for the child to be safe. Uh, or is homeschool the best option? I realize that's kind of a complicated question, um, but it gets to that point of prioritizing safety. Um, mm -hmm. So do, do you have any thought on that, you know, as parents try to uh, find places knowing that they may have, you know, for instance, my son went through a very traumatic experience at his school. Um, mm -hmm. To expect a child who is significantly traumatized uh, to have experience a trauma on a Monday and come back on a Tuesday is not really being mindful of, of the impact. Um, any thoughts on how a parent might proceed uh, in a situation like that? Well, so the first thought, and I feel like it's a gut feeling, the first thought that comes to mind is we need each other. And I think with a decision that's that critical and, and finding that safe placement, um, and, and I'm just speaking, this is just my opinion. I think we need to reach out to people that we trust and people that we, you know, that support us and, and really gather information. But that also includes really listening to the nervous system of our child too. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really knowing, because as parents, we are our children's advocates mm -hmm. and, um, and we, and, and we, you know, that is, we're not living their lives, but we are their advocates. So again, not knowing what I know personally about your situation, I think as you ponder what you just asked in that question, I would be gathering information and mm -hmm. I would be gathering it from people and places and organizations, organizations I trust and also listening, um, you know, to, you know, how just listening to what my child is sensing and feeling. Yeah, I mean, taking into account that that sense of 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 safety, you know, I think mm -hmm. uh, I probably shared with you before. Um, after my son was restrained, and secluded in the fifth grade, 
he was afraid to go back. And we ended up homeschooling for two years, not because that had been our intent, but, but, you know, we took his feelings into account and, and what, yeah. what his body was telling him. And I think we did the best thing. It wasn't what we intended to do, but I think that, mm -hmm. um, that gave us an opportunity for some healing and, uh, for him to feel like he was in a safe environment. And we were eventually able to do other things. And of course we, we had another negative experience, but now he's been at the same placement for three years. It's a really, fantastic placement for him and he has done really well but i think really you know listening to the feedback in whatever way you're able to from your child is really really important mm -hmm. absolutely and our children you know just because they have smaller bodies and they haven't been on the planet as long as we have they carry a lot of wisdom mm -hmm. and and that is something that i'm learning they're you know i mean they i our bodies have the wisdom too, but our children are more, sometimes they're more attuned mm -hmm. um, because they've not had the conditioning, you know, away from that connection of brain body. We and, just and, don't have it. And being heard and, and seen and valued yes. uh, even builds that. It builds that. Um, so, you know, definitely listening. Uh, another question here from Tamika who says, what are some examples or illustrations of best practices of co-regulation when a child is in fight or flight and actually uh, fighting or eloping? Well, and that that's really hard because at that point, if they are escalated to the point of fighting and eloping, that no one, I mean, that's gonna be really hard to co-regulate at that point. Mm -hmm. So co-regulation is really, um, you know, when a child is there, they're not going to hear words. They're not going to hear consequences if they're running out of a class or if they're fighting. So, you know, they don't, the, the cortex is offline at that point. Mm -hmm. So I, time and space, um, keeping them safe, um, being present, but, but just, you know, again, sharing your presence with them while you keep them safe. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, is, is really important, but this work is preventative. Mm -hmm. You know, so I would take that experience once everyone's calm and, and really talk about what are, th you know, what are three practices that we can do when you start to feel like you're going to run or pop off. Um, because if we've reached that point, it's not the point of no return, but it's the point where um, that nervous system is really in that um, protection mode mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and there's mm -hmm. not much, we don't have a lot of choice at that mm -hmm, point. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm going to add something if you don't mind and, and I'll, yeah. I'm interested in your, your response, but you know, I would say that that's a time to not to further escalate because even though they oh, may yeah. be in fight or flight mode uh, you know, I think about things that happen to kids like restrained seclusion and, and the moment you go hands on things are elevating up yeah. 10 times. Um, so, you know, where you can, you know, make yourself smaller, make yourself less threatening, be alongside, but, you know, if a child's mm -hmm. eloping, are they eloping in a way that really is dangerous or can you follow from a distance and, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, you know, I mean, my son, sometimes what I learned as a parent was, uh, sometimes he actually needed that space and it was a matter of, mm -hmm. okay, I get it. You, you need the space, um, you know, using that calm voice. I think anything we can do to not further escalate and, and unfortunately right. the, the tendency Definitely. is, you know, yeah. kids in fight or flight, the tendency sometimes is to want to control the situation. Um, and sometimes it's, it's enough to be alongside without escalating and they might be able to come back down from that. Um, now, again, some situations may go to the point that something has to be done for a, for a true emergency situation. But, you know, I think many times I, I think about that photograph that you shared and the principal coming up alongside and, you know, not being threatening, probably using a really calm voice. Um, and, and I agree with you. I'm, I'm so, um, you know, so much in the camp of this is about being proactive. This is about learning. This is about teaching kids and, and staff and everyone to change because so much of crisis is avoidable um, if we're really thinking proactively, if we're thinking about a neuro, you know, the neuroscience and thinking about trauma. So, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, but it's just, again, it's like, take, instead of taking a step forward, take a step back, you know, um, make sure yeah. you're regulated. No, absolutely. And at that point, the only person you can control is yourself. Right. Um, and, and, and that's really, again, that's, it's hard to hear in escalation, but when we reach that, you know, when that, again, when that 
that student is mobilizing to the point of fighting or running, then, um, you know, we've we've got to really pay attention to our nervous system state. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and that's mm -hmm. counterproductive in the mm -hmm. ways that we traditionally look at discipline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, and Tamika followed up with another question, just asking about the best resources for teaching elementary students about auto uh, autonomic uh, stress. And of course, I, I think immediately that there's some some great resources out there like your book. Uh, and of course, I think about the graduate program you offer. But are there other things that you think would be helpful? So um, through the Polyvagal Institute, um, I am teaching it's five. It's one hour once a month for five months and we're you move as a cohort and so um we are in the first cohort right now i think we've got about 42 people enrolled but it's really um it's just it's it's a great way um to integrate um the applied educational neuroscience and polyvagal in it's for teachers you know it's for not just teachers it's for educators so the next cohort begins in april and if you go to the Polyvagal Institute, um, I don't think they've put it up yet, the dates, but that's a great place <coughs> of resources, too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, well, yeah. we are at five o'clock, and I know we have a couple other questions, but um, I, I want to be mindful of your time and, uh, you know, of course, invite people to, uh, you know, if you have some follow-up questions, feel free to shoot me an email as well. I'll put my email in the chat. I did have a couple of questions about whether your slides are something that, that can be shared. Uh, and I reminded people that we are recording this, so the recording's available, um, you know, but it, you can let me know one way or another if you're uh, able to. Um, I always find that slides are can be helpful, but in without the context, sometimes it's a little tough too. Yeah, and I did jump around quite a bit today, unfortunately. Yeah. So, right. um, but yeah, let, I'll think about maybe um, some of the graphics I have that I can send to you guys. Okay. Um, you know, like the Anne's characters and, mm -hmm. and maybe even a couple of slides that, you know, that if someone has, you know, if there's one that just really, you know, you need, you want to see that, that I'm, I'm fine with that. Okay. And I'm going to put my email here in the chat so that people can reach out to me, uh, if they'd like, if there's something specific that they were after. And again, uh, this will be, it's recorded. It'll be on YouTube, Facebook, and an audio podcast. Uh, I really encourage you. And there were a couple of questions here about kind of how do we make this shift? How do we get people to make this shift? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think sharing this presentation is a great start. Telling people about the Applied Educational Neuroscience Program. You know, if we can mm -hmm. get uh, an educator in your school that is, is going through this. Um, you know, we were talking earlier, Lori, about uh, how what a pleasure it was to join you in your class. And I see all these amazing educators that are making the shift and, you know, kind of said, well, these are people that are disruptors. They're going to go in and they're going to help it change entire systems. Uh, and, and that's so, so meaningful. So, you know, Lori, I want to I want to thank you uh, so much for joining us today. I know that you are, uh, as always, very busy and have a lot on your plate. And as you mentioned in the beginning, you know, there's a lot of, you know, this is a tough time for all of us and, it and, is. and people out there doing the work that you're doing. Um, I will put your website also uh, in the chat here in a moment. Um, but Lori, I wanted to, to um, make a, a, a slight deviation from what I had told you, if you don't mind. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to just make a quick announcement. And then I wanted to ask you if you would mind taking us out with a very short focused attention practice to, to give people an idea, because I've been joining your class and you do that and it doesn't have to be anything complicated, but I'd love to share with people, like what is something that we can do when, you know, we're, we're feeling our, our brain and bodies uh, kind of moving in a different direction. So I'll give you a minute to think about that as I give a quick announcement. Do you mind? I'm, I know I'm putting you on the no, spot. I would, no, I would absolutely love it. Okay, and, great. Um, Great. So I'm going to make a, a couple quick announcements and then we will come back to that. Uh, so uh, in terms of announcements, a couple things I wanted to mention. Uh, one is that uh, if you haven't seen it already, we put together a uh, a great model legislation toolkit. Uh, and actually, Lori was one of the people we interviewed when we did that. Uh, and the, the model legislation toolkit is really focused at uh, providing a model for state level legislation in order to change uh, laws and policies around things like restrained seclusion. Uh, that's on the endseclusion.org website. Um, I'm really proud of the work that was done on that. We had a great team of interns from the Heller School of Social Management and a lot of people that participated in that process. Uh, not only is it a great list of, of things you should think about for legislation, but also to help provide you with the pathway of doing it. 
Uh, and as always, anybody that's interested in pushing state level legislation in their state, feel free to reach out to us and we're always happy to help. Uh, another quick announcement, and I'm just going to share my screen real quickly, uh, is in terms of what's coming up next. And as you know, we do this every two weeks and sometimes even sooner. Uh, we've got a really great presentation coming up uh, next time, Olivia Haig, uh, who is an occupational therapist. And Olivia's going to be sharing kind of uh, her work as an occupational therapist. Uh, talking about moving beyond kind of compliance-based approaches, uh, talking about moving beyond behaviorism and kind of answering that question of what can we do instead? Uh, so really looking forward to that. Uh, therapist with over 20 years of experience uh, and kind of a very like-minded individual in terms of thinking about, again, what are the better things that we can do to help and support kids? So that's it for my announcements. And, and we're, again, we're going to take a pivot here, um, Dr. Laurie, and um, I'll let you kind of tell people what, you know, where to go from here, but I'll let you take it, take us out of here. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys. So um, I, I wanted to mention too, that in guy is sharing my website. There's there are tons of information on my website. You can download, you can make, you can print out, you can make posters um, there. It's just all for you. So a lot of what I've talked about today, um, you'll find on the website, a focused attention practice is what we are we're, we're using art and drawing and breath and movement and, you know, ways that are part of our procedures and routines when kids come in, when they leave the beginning of a class period. A focused attention practice is an executive function practice, really. And it helps our children and our adolescents to focus on a sensation. So I'm going to have because I'm going to do an adult one tonight. Um, I mean, kids can do it too. Our, our kids love this too, but you have, if you put your hands underneath your earlobes, you can feel these two large muscles. And I'm not going to say the name correctly. I think it's like sternocleidomastoid muscles and you can feel them. They're big. And just like our psoas muscles, they hold stress. And so sometimes when, you know, I know I hold it in my neck and my shoulders. So, and you can do this to a child or you can do this to your partner or we can do it to ourselves. So there's lots, lots of ways, but if you take your hands, take your fingertips and then just trace those down as you take a couple of deep breaths. So you're going all the way down to your clavicle and it almost makes you take a deep breath. So just go ahead and just kind of breathe in and out on your own, that nice deep belly breath as you just trace those muscles. And then take your hands, once you've kind of tracked those and you've put pressure on those muscles, take your hands on the back of your neck and then just literally, it's my hands are going in an opposite direction, but just take your hands and just go all the way down to that sternocleido, that big, thick muscle to the clavicle. And just take two more deep, deep breath. And one more, just feel that nice pressure along your neck and all the way down. Thank you so much. You. Um, what a fantastic uh, afternoon this has been. So much appreciate you and all that you're doing. And I want to thank everybody who watched today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and go off air. And uh, thank you so much.